أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم Respected brothers, sisters, and youth in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we are in the month of Ramadan, the blessed month that is intimately linked with the Noble Quran, because the Quran was revealed uh, in this month to the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam for the first time, the first few ayats in the cave of Hira. There are many. Other events also that are linked with the month of Ramadan. And today I'm going to touch on three of them. Uh, the first one, of course, is the Battle of Badr that occurred in the second year of the Hijra. The second is the liberation of Makkah that occurred in the eighth year of the Hijra. And then the fourth event, or the third event that occurred, was the martyrdom of uh, Imam Ali. Alayhi salam, and that had enormous implications for Islamic governance and Islamic rules uh, in society. Let's begin with the Battle of Badr and why it is important in Islamic history. I won't go into the details of the circumstances that led to the Battle of Badr, but uh, what I would say is that the Battle of Badr was in fact the first military encounter that the Muslims had with the mushriks of Mecca. And until that time, the Muslims had not been tested in battle. It was also the first year in which uh, Ramadan was made compulsory for Muslims. So they were facing not one, but two tests. First, they were fasting for the first time in their lives as Muslims. And number two, now they were uh, confronted by a military challenge that according to normal uh, circumstances, the odds were enormously against them. There were only 313 Muslims, whereas the Mushriks were more than a thousand strong. The Mushriks were heavily armed. They had participated in many wars and battles before. And on the Muslim side, the 313 committed Muslims had just a few swords between them, a few horses, and some arrows. And the other challenge that the Muslims faced was that they were now confronting uh, not only the enemy, the Mushrik enemies, but among that Mushrik group were the Muslims' own brothers, own fathers, own cousins, and relatives. And so this was a major, major challenge for them at every level. But Alhamdulillah, as it turned out, the Muslims inflicted a crushing defeat upon the Mushriks, killing many of their leading figures, including Abu Jahal, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, uh, Shaiba and Utba and Rabia, etc. A, lot, a whole lot of uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, etc. All of them were killed in that battle, about 70 of them. And uh, this was, in fact, a great victory for the Muslims and for Islam. Because consider, if the Muslims had lost that battle, perhaps Islam would have been dealt a very severe blow and it may not have been able to survive in that society. We know from the Quran that there are many other prophets that delivered the, their message to their people, but unfortunately the people did not accept that message. And so, their message basically just withered away. Now, that's why the Battle of Badr was extremely important because it established for the first time that Muslims are now an organized group in which they are prepared to lay down their lives for the sake of Islam, for the principles of Islam, and to confront any power that comes against them. So Badr actually, became a defining moment in early Islamic history. In fact, uh, it, the Quran itself says that those people that participated in Badr are superior to the Muslims that came afterwards. The reason being that when people are not tested, when the odds are extremely high, then obviously uh, participating in such a challenging uh, mission is extremely demanding and it requires resolve and sacrifices. 
So for Muslims, the Battle of Badr was a very important defining moment, perhaps second only to the revelation of the noble Quran itself. Now, when we come to the liberation of Mecca, that occurred in the eighth year of the Hijra, and about 10,000 Muslims marched on Mecca. And again, it was the month of Ramadan. And the reason for the Muslims marching on Mecca was because the Meccan Mushriks had broken their agreement, which was uh, 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 the, the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, uh, in which they had vowed not to engage in military conflict with the Muslims. They had vowed that uh, they would not persecute the allies of the Muslims, and yet the Meccan Mushriks or one of their allies violated that agreement. And then they even refused to make restitution for the horrors that they had perpetrated. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam assembled a force of 10,000 Muslims and they marched on Mecca. But the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam issued strict orders that no conflict should take place inside Mecca and Muslims should not engage in battle unless they are attacked. And so in that sense, uh, it was not a belligerent uh, operation. It was again a, uh, an operation that was launched in order to avenge the, the death of an ally of the Muslims, as well as the breaking of the agreement by the Meccan Mushriks, and then by their refusal to, in fact, um, even uh, pay uh, restitution for the crime that they had committed. Now, it's, it's important for us to keep in mind that uh, whether it was the Battle of Badr or uh, the liberation of Mecca or the other battles in between, uh, one person who was intimately involved in all of these conflicts against the Muslims was Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. Now, Abu Sufyan was, of course, a, a chief of Mecca. And, and since in the Battle of Badr, he did not directly participate because he was leading that caravan from uh, first from Mecca to Syria, passing nearby to Medina, and then on the way back when he was uh, bringing that caravan back. And it was Abu Sufyan who had sent a word to the Meccan chiefs to say that their caravan was under threat and they should come out to defend it. And that's how the Battle of Badr occurred. Now, when the Muslims uh, liberated Mecca uh, without too much of a fight, uh, of course, the Meccans basically surrendered and the Prophet ﷺ, when he gathered these people around the Kaaba, he asked them, how should I treat you? And, and they said, uh, you are a noble person. You are the son of a noble person. You are the nephew of a noble person. They sort of made all of these statements to the Nabi ﷺ. And at the end of it, although the Muslims and the Nabi ﷺ would have been perfectly justified in having those people executed, but he didn't. He told them, you are free to go. He actually used the word <clears throat> that you are tulaqa. Tulaqa means you are detached from us. I let you go. Now, it's important to keep this, this uh, expression in, in mind, in context as well, because tulaqa means we are detached from you. We, are, we have let you go, but you're not one of us. And of course, these people, uh, they were now forced to accept Islam, including Abu Sufyan and his family because they were left with absolutely no choice. And that's when they came into Islam. So the people that came into the fold of Islam at the time of the liberation of Mecca were basically, refer, uh, they are referred to in Islamic terminology as tulaqa. That means we let you go. You know, you, uh, you are not part of us, but we let you go and so on. Now, let's come to the other aspect of the martyrdom of Imam Ali alayhi Again, it was in the month of Ramadan. Now we know that after the Prophet ﷺ passed away and there was Islamic rule, uh, Imam Ali was, uh, was the, uh, at the end, Imam Ali was the Khalifa of the Muslims. And again, um, he had had to wage several battles against these uh, rebellious people. One of them, which was uh, the Battle of Sifin, which now Abu Sufyan's son Muawiyah had uh, uh, waged against the legitimate authority of Imam Ali. And of course, uh, you know, there are some companions of, um, in, in Imam Ali's uh, group. Uh, and 
when the, the forces of the Imam were about to vanquish Muawiyah's forces, they played a trick. And of course, uh, you know, they, they said that we are going to have a, a peaceful resolution, let the Quran be our judge, etc. Even though Imam Ali warned his supporters that this is a trick, unfortunately, uh, quite a lot of them, they did not abide by that. And so this um, truce had to be uh, agreed upon. Now, within that group that were with Imam Ali, some of them broke away from that and uh, from him, and that group is referred to in Islamic history as the Khawarij, the outsiders. And these were people that considered themselves to be super Muslims, that they knew more about Islam than, than uh, Imam Ali -Islam and, and his close companions, etc. And these Khawarij felt that um, uh, that that what the whatever Imam Ali agreed to that was not right, and therefore. One person by the name of uh, Ibn Muljam, who basically took a poisoned uh, dagger. And when Imam Ali was going for Fajr prayers, he stabbed him with that dagger. And that was what led to his martyrdom. This incident is important for us to keep in mind because the martyrdom of Imam Ali was not merely the martyrdom uh, or the elimination of one individual but it was also an attack on Islamic legitimacy. It was an attack on the Islamic governance that was established in the Arabian Peninsula. And it dealt a deathly blow to uh, the system. And of course, regrettably, uh, Islam uh, did not recover from it or the Muslims did not recover from it for a long time. In fact, one great Algerian scholar, uh, Malik bin Nabi, may Allah bless his soul, had written about uh, both the Battle of Sifin that Muawiyah waged against uh, Imam Ali as well as his martyrdom. And he said that this was the Jahili spirit confronting Islam and dealing it a major blow. Now, we need to keep in mind, now here is how we need to sort of, you know, bring this whole thing together that the Battle of Badr, uh, which basically was initiated by Abu Sufyan, uh, the liberation of Mecca when Abu Sufyan and his family had no choice but to accept Islam and a whole lot of other people in Mecca because now they could no longer uh, confront the Muslims militarily. And then as soon as they got an opportunity to create fitna in the Islamic polity, they struck and that is when um, Imam Ali uh, was martyred. So as I mentioned, his martyrdom is not just the martyrdom or the elimination of one individual. It was a blow to the Islamic system of governance. It was a blow to the idea of Islam. And of course, that is where they uh, violated the fundamental principles of Islam. So when we, in this Ramadan, when we talk about Ramadan and the fasting and going without food and, and so on, we need to keep in mind that the early Muslims remained extremely active, that they participated in the Battle of Badr, they marched all the way from Medina to Mecca to liberate Mecca at the time of the month of Ramadan. And imagine in the Arabian Peninsula, temperatures uh, go very high, uh, they are extremely hot. Secondly, uh, you know, at that time there were no cars or buses or planes or trains, people had to walk or at the most they would probably ride a horse or a camel. And so imagine the kind of challenges they faced at that time. So when we go through our Ramadan, we need to remember that these are the kinds of challenges that we must also face in order to confront our enemies that are constantly around us and threatening us with annihilation. We see this operating all over the world. There are many places where Muslims are struggling in Palestine, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, in Iran, in you know, so many other places against these forces of Taghut and these tyrants and oppressors that want to uh, destroy the spirit of Islam. So when we go through this month of Ramadan, we need to keep in mind that this is a month of struggle, this is a month of sacrifices, and this is a month when inshallah Islam would be victorious. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them uh, and try my best to, to answer them. So please um, go ahead. Are they, Mahboub, are there any questions from anybody? So far, we don't have any questions. All right, okay. Sorry? Uh, they're, they're asking you to increase to increase your the time of your lecture yeah, increase the dose increase the dose okay if you want what promoting yeah okay inshallah like you know what i the reason why i did was that you know we started at um, according to our time 125 and i finished at 140 so i so basically made it 15 minutes i could do it for you know 20 minutes there's no not a problem but the reason why I sort of, you know, restricted it was that, um, um, uh, you know, I wanted to see if we could finish uh, a little early because, as I mentioned, we are going to be having our, uh, you know, Zohar Salat here, and other people will join. So I wanted to be able to uh, have this this recording completed by that time. Well, what we can do is, uh, you know, uh, we can we can basically discuss these issues, I don't think there is any problem, um, you know, uh, because I think it's it's important that we understand that uh, even at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, despite the fact that he was among the Muslims, uh, that it was not something uh, that uh, they did not face any challenges in the sense that even though uh, those people knew that uh, uh, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah, and yet there, there were uh, not only the Makkan Mushriks, the, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to face the Yahud, the, the, you know, the Bedouin tribes from Najad and you know, the, uh, the others like, you know, they're from all over uh, in, in that Arabian Peninsula in the North and Northeast. And then also uh, there were the Munafikin in, in Medina. These are people uh, that basically uh, you know, pretended to be Muslims, but in fact, um, you know, they were only there for their own personal interests. Uh, and I think if we if we study the um, events surrounding the Battle of Uhud, uh, in which the Muslims unfortunately suffered a setback, uh, the Muslims uh, had set out with uh, 1,000 people altogether, uh, and yet before they uh, reached uh, the the battle of Uhud, about 300 of them broke away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now these 300 that broke away were, were led by uh, the, the chief Munafiq, his name was Abdullah Ibn Ubay. And he is a one character in uh, the early history of Islam who caused a lot of damage to the Muslims. Now it's, it's something really very curious uh, in Islamic history and this is something that I think we need to pay attention to, that while at the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, particularly in Medina, every year the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would ask uh, some of his companions to compile the list of all the Muslims uh, so that we know exactly you know, how many Muslims we have in society. Now, of course, Medina was a small locality. There are only about 5,000 people altogether there. But the fact that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would compile a list of Muslims every year indicates that this, there was a very organized system. Now, surely it cannot be that the names of the Munafikin were not known or not recorded at the same time. And yet when we look at Islamic history, we find that there are the names of only three or four individuals that are mentioned in uh, Sira literature, 
And I find it extremely difficult and troubling and worrying that despite the fact that uh, at the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he took such meticulous care of uh, writing down the names of all of the Muslims, that there would be no record of the names of the Munafiks. Obviously, there is something wrong that this uh, evidence, this information was obliterated from, uh, from Islamic history because there were a lot of people that had vested interests that had played a very dirty and destructive role against the Prophet وسلم, and against the Muslims. And regrettably, we don't have their names. So as I mentioned, you know, Abdullah ibn Ubay is well known in Islamic history as the chief of the Munafiks, but he was not the only one. If there were 300 people that broke away from the Muslims at the Battle of Uhud, then surely we need to know who these 300 people were. But regrettably, we don't have that evidence. The same thing applies to the expedition of Tabuk that was mentioned in, that was launched in the ninth year of the Hijrah. There were many Munafikin that made excuses and the Prophet ﷺ let them go because he knew that these people will not support the Muslims. And yet again, apart from maybe two, three names, the rest of the names are not known to us. So this is a gap in Islamic history that we really need to uh, think about seriously. And if we can find by any means, I don't know how, because you know, so far no evidence has been uh, found uh, to, to see whether uh, you know, there, there, any, any lists have survived from that time. But regrettably, that's a gap in Islamic history that has caused uh, Muslims uh, grievous harm. Assalamualaikum. Wa salam. How are you, Zafar Bhai? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'm okay. Yes. Zafar Bhai, I just wanted to ask you, you know, yes. during the time of Prophet movement, there yes. was a system of tribalism. So what yes. are the challenges Rasulullah faced and how the tribalism characteristics reacts? Because we have to see here also in today's world, at present, we have a groupism and communities in the form of tribalism you know, favorism and all these things. So if you can share the light, not today, maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow, whenever you have time, you can share the light. So we can get an idea how to tackle all those things. Because here also in, in today's world also is same like this. Oh, this is family merchants and this is this merchants. This is Falanas, this is Dimkas and they favor each other. And like this, you know, in community, then public is not going out of community. You see, color uh, this thing and all this thing. So how did Rasulullah face all this thing? You see, right. So this That's is very right. important thing for a ground realities to understand. So it will it can help us to understand what kind of uh, this thing Rasulullah faced. So I think it's a very good question and it definitely needs to be addressed. Let me quickly say that um, basically. If Muslims are not truly attached to Islam, then these other kinds of loyalties come into play. So whether it is, you know, merchants sort of, you know, uh, pretending or showing themselves to be superior to others or people that may have, let's say, certain positions and authorities that they consider themselves superior or certain families that consider themselves superior or certain tribes. And again, this notion of color, et cetera, Whereas in fact, you know, Islam is absolutely against all of these things. Uh, you know, um, we, we know from the Quran, uh, when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, uh, in, this is in Surah Al-Hujarat, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaknakum min dhakarin wa unsa wa ja'alnakum shu'ubun wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the whole of humanity says that I created you uh, from a male and a female and spread you into communities and tribes and, and nations, etc., so that you may recognize each other. And the best in the sight of Allah is the person who has taqwa. Now, of course, taqwa is a very, very important concept in Islam that we really need to understand properly. Uh, it, it's, in fact, uh, most widely used. And in that sense, uh, Islam has established the criterion that uh, in, in, in the sight of Allah, only taqwa matters, not color, not birth, not position, not wealth, not authority, nothing matters. Uh, you know, and, and regrettably, human beings uh, follow this tendency 
in which they create these divisions. And this is in fact an Iblisi tendency because we know that when uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created Adam alayhi salam and he ordered the angels and Iblis to bow to Adam alayhi salam, the angels complied, but uh, Iblis refused. And when Allah asked him as to why, he said, you know, uh, Iblis' answer is very, very uh, instructive for us today. He says, Ana minhum. I'm superior than him. You have, I'm created out of fire and he's created out of mud. So in other words, Iblis himself automatically assumed that he is superior. And the same thing applies today with people of, you know, of different tribes or different colors or different you know, origins, etc. languages. They think that they are superior to somebody else. This is the Iblisi tendency that we have to, first of all, identify and secondly, defeat and obliterate. And, and it's extremely important that Muslims concentrate, particularly in this month of Ramadan, that uh, for us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established the criterion of taqwa. And so that is what we are going to be uh, judging uh, each other by. In fact, we should not be passing judgment on each other. That's not our job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the judge. We should just see what the actions of the individuals are. And based on that, we can you know, establish our relationship. But regrettably, when we lack taqwa, when we lack uh, iman, when we lack understanding of Islam, then we fall into these kinds of uh, notions that basically uh, create divisions and conflict in society. I hope that that sort of you know, uh, answers uh, this question that you have raised. Is there any other comment? Yes, if not, that, then maybe we can, we can sort of, uh, the, if there is any comment, I'll take it quickly. Uh, if not, then we will inshallah meet again tomorrow and I will you know, bring this aspect also into the discussion so that we can you know, deal with it in, in, in a comprehensive manner, inshallah. Inshallah, thank you. We don't have any more comments. I think we can, okay. we can uh, continue tomorrow, inshallah. Thank you very much, Allah okay. bless you. Jazakallah. And, and I, I, I pray that everybody's uh, Ramadan is going well. May Allah bless you all and reward you for all of your efforts, inshallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.